What are we going to learn about this time? So, like I said, we're going to start from the beginning of Honeycutt's Firepower Archives, um, which is interesting because it doesn't start with the World War I heavy tanks, even though I do believe that's where the, the book starts, uh, because I think he got most of that information from his mentor, uh, Robert J. X, who he has his own tremendous archive that actually makes Honeycutt's archive look small. Um, you know, archive envy, it's a thing. Uh, so today we're going to start, this is volume one of the Firepower Archives, and it starts with, let's see here. Okay, let me switch here to scanner. Hey, it works, okay. So we are looking here at heavy tanks. This is, so if you have Firepower, this is pages 27 through 53. And as you can see, it's a little bit more than just 20 some pages. Um, so we are going to look at here. Okay, so, this, so most of Honeycutt's uh, notebooks, when he starts out, he actually has some of his actual text that he will eventually later put in the book. So we're actually seeing where he's talking about heavy and assault tank development uh, in the 1940s. And it actually leads to the, see here, he's talking about all the way leading up to the heavy tank M46. Um, and he talks about how that all began uh, back in World War One, with the development of the Mark 8 tank as a joint uh, allied project between United States, France, and Great Britain. So that's pretty much what the first couple pages here are, which i got to be very careful with here. Um, so like I did last time, uh, you'll notice I'm not wearing any gloves handling paper artifacts like this. Uh, it's actually better not to wear gloves uh, because wearing the gloves, you lose some of the textile ability in your fingertips. It's actually easier to tear the pages then. So I've washed my hands uh, nice and clean before starting this. Uh, and if I go up and I, you know, just get a drink of water or anything else, which I go into a whole nother room to do, I don't allow food or drink in this room uh, with the archives. Uh, I wash my hands completely again just because I do not want to damage uh, these documents. Uh, so that's pretty much what we're looking at right now. We're actually looking at essentially the original manuscript uh, for Firepower. Um, here he's talking about how uh, after they realized that the M1, or excuse me, M6 heavy tank uh, wasn't going to cut, that they were already looking at taking the T20 series of medium tanks and developing that into a heavy tank, which we all now know as the M26 Pershing. Um, so that's you know pretty cool to see his own handwritten notes. So here, um, a letter from the commanding officer, Aberdeen Proving Ground, in September 1939. And if you know your history, you know that a certain world war started that month recommended the development of a heavy tank and stated some desirable characteristics for such a tank based on tank ex test experience at the proving ground. Uh, notice they say nothing on real world examples or lessons. Uh, and talking about how many machine guns that they wanted, that seems to have been a great uh, matter of discussion because more machine guns uh, at the time was always seen as better. So... Okay, so yeah, this is pretty much the manuscript for Firepower. That's actually pretty cool to actually get to see the initial uh, manus manuscript for it. Okay, so moving on. So it seems like this is all the, the M6, M6A1. Okay, so this is kind of cool. So in certain points of the uh, books, Honeycutt makes a reference then. Um, first of all, he has your what technical manuals he's referencing. So those are the actual tank manuals. So you can see the, make sure it's in the camera, at the very top he references TM9-721. So that's the M6 and M6A1 heavy tank manual. Um, but looking down through here, you see what he has, OCMs. And those are Ordnance Committee uh, minute notes. So every time the Ordnance Committee met, uh, these are all the guys who are in charge of developing tanks, field artillery, any heavy piece of equipment uh, from rifles to tanks and beyond. Uh, when they met, they recorded what they discussed. Um, now, it's not recorded like a, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not a script. Uh, it's not recorded line by line, but the, the general conversations recorded. Uh and it gives us a lot of insight as to why certain decisions were made. And, and it really does break it down. And so he references those ordinance committee notes. So theoretically, you could take this then to the National Archives, look up those minute notes, and actually see what exactly was going on at that meeting, why certain decisions were made. And the nice thing is, for the most part, most part, most of the ones that Honeycutt references, we have in our archives. Uh, and that, in my opinion, they're, they're, that's where some of the juicier history stuff is located. Uh, 
kind of gives us insight as to why, especially when you get to the Sherman tank where they're going back and forth on different uh, modifications, different improvements. They really go into the nitty gritty on why certain things were uh, decided upon. Am I talking too fast? Am I doing all right so far? Sounds good to me. Oh, okie dokie. All right, so typical characteristics sheet, uh, letting us know that the uh, M6 weighed 126,500 pounds, so fairly heavy tank for American standards at the time, actually heavier than a Tiger One, if I'm reading this, thinking of this correctly. Uh, 24 feet, 9 inches long, and ground pressure of only 12.3 pounds, so that's not bad at all. That's actually almost the equivalent of the M1 Abrams tank uh, today. But definitely a lot less uh, ground contact pressure than the uh, T30 we were looking at and yeah. T29 we were looking at last time. So you have, let's see, one three-inch gun. So the gun mounted, you have two main guns actually on the M6. You have the three-inch gun, which is very similar, actually pretty much the same gun that's mounted on the M10 tank destroyer. And then you actually have then a coaxial 37-millimeter gun, which is the same gun on the Stewart family of tanks. So that's that's a lot of lot of main gun firepower for one tank, uh, but probably too much. Kind of like how we were talking, you know, the mouse had not only the 128, but had the 75 millimeter. Um, that, can, that can get a little chaotic with that much uh, different loadings of different ammunitions going on. Uh, states would have had 75 main gun rounds with 202 rounds of 37 millimeter ammunition, and then five over 5,000 rounds of 50 caliber, seven and a half thousand rounds of 30 caliber, um, 1,200 rounds of pistol ammunition, grenades, um, all of the fine details. Um, interesting, it has different sets of radios, including a set for a specific command tank. Um, I wonder if it doesn't mention... It doesn't say how many crew, though I believe it would have been... Fairly standard. Okay, so here it's talking about when the T1E1 was approved... So this is more Ordnance Committee note minutes, references. All right, here they're discussing, they were talking to representative of the Oldsmobile Division, General Motor Corps, uh, to work on the hydromatic transmission that had been used in the tank. Yeah, this is all talking about the, the inner workings that we're going to try to develop. Tank. I think, you know, all of this that we're seeing, all this text, this is all just on the M6 media. So I think what, you know, what most likely happened is a lot of this didn't make the cut in, in Honeycutt's book. Does it talk um, about so the electric? I, in one of the other pages, it talks about uh, testing the electric drive at Aberdeen. Does it go into any detail about that? Ooh, let me see here. Well, here's... Oh, here we go. Throughout test... Oh, wow. Y either you have really good eyesight or you just picked a really good time to mention it. Uh, throughout the tests, operation of the electric drive was so satisfactory that an ordinance committee uh, minute or memo uh, proposing standardization of the vehicle as heavy tank M6A2 was prepared and as a matter of fact this designation was used unofficially in some correspondence uh, however it was tabled so they tested the electric drive um, they really liked it but it never was implemented hmm. and unfortunately he doesn't give more of an explanation on that um, that would be interesting to follow up on as to you know why it did so well um, yeah, here it says, um, test assembly of tank preparatory, negotiate comparative ease. Okay, on 21 April 1942, the vehicle was demonstrated in the field and on the highway for Brigadier General Barnes. So Gladion Barnes is the guy running the, the tank side of the Ordnance Corps. Uh, and he actually has his hand in a lot of the design of the Sherman and the Pershing tank. Uh, and an accompanying staff, this demonstration was so impressive that orders were placed for 27 additional electric drive units. After this, the vehicle was torn down for inspection, typical, and repair or replacement of the various electrical and mechanical components. It was reassembled with the turret, but without armament and stowage, and on 21 May 1942, it was received at Aberdeen Proving Ground, where heavy slugs were added to bring the vehicle up to its maximum weight. Uh, because a lot of times you'll see test vehicles... Uh, where they have extra plates or weights welded on, and that's all to test out, make sure the vehicle can actually handle its combat weight. Uh, when you're testing a vehicle, you don't want to load it completely full up of gasoline, ammunition, unnecessary crew members, things that go boom and go squish when you don't need into a testing phase. Uh, so you put extra weight on the vehicle to simulate that, and that's one of the things they're talking about there. So I wish they went into more detail on, the, uh, on why the electric drive was not used and was then stolen uh, by Sean Connery for the October. 
with those with that information on the specific results from testing whenever they found unfavorable weather was because I mentioned for a moment there that the metal brushes wore down really quickly and things like this. Uh, would that would further information be in those OCM? Uh, it should be. Have? It should be. And so that would be the thing to go to. And that's one of the things I, I, I really like about Honeycutt is he's always, he always will reference, well, according to OCM 164, whatever it is, um, and then I'll have a blurb on it. And so usually if you go back to that, you can usually find out more information. Gotcha. And I know where those are sitting in my archive, so it's very possible I can go back and look to see what's going on with that. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so this is all just his, his transcripts. Here's a whole other copy, actually signed, but looks like the Honeycutt. Uh, oh, here's some of the Orange Committee notes, actually. So 